uh, that's me who uh, need to appreciate the opportunity that you kindly shared um, for for this opportunity to talk to you and the respected audience here regarding the the role of brain mapping in the study of sleep. So we got two different uh, perspectives in the study of brain and cognitive science when it comes to the idea of sleep research. Number one is brain sleep. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's sleep brain mapping or SBM. That's why we're doing the brain mapping uh, uh, based research while the subject or subjects in the, in the population based studies are already in a sleep position. And the other is behavioral sleep medicine. So we have SBM and we have BSM. SBM stands for sleep brain mapping and BSM stands for behavioral sleep medicine. So what I'm going to highlight here is that I got like 50 something minutes to touch on uh, some of the findings from a series of research that we've been involved with over the past uh, uh, like several years. And uh, if this has been done in collaboration with uh, our uh, uh, scientific uh, advisors and counterparts in the uh, sleep disorders unit at the Neuroscience Center in Indicasat AIP in Panama City, Central America. And over the past several uh, months, I've been uh, working closely with the SBMT. And you all know that today we're expecting to receive a call also from the, the founding chairman of the SBMT, Professor Kateb, but uh, something emergency in the operating room happened to him and we we were not fortunate to have him but anyway i'm going to uh, take over and on behalf of sbmt i'm going to share some words regarding the society for brain mapping and therapeutics which is based in los angeles and uh, how importantly that can come into collaborations with the nbml in iran and other similar platform worldwide and how we can take the the level of our understanding and our research endeavors to an even higher level level together Okay, with regards to those sleep-wake disorders, uh, based on the latest international classification of sleep disorders or ICSD, you might have known that we got more than 80 types of sleep-related predicaments. To be precise, we have around like 84 different types of sleep disorders. And some of the sleep disorders are organic and they do not necessarily have to do something in the brain, although the outcome of the problem is going to negatively hamper the function of the brain while we're asleep, because we all know that sleep is of the brain, for the brain, and by the brain. So uh, everything ends up to the brain when it comes to sleep's uh, idea. But some something, for example, uh, in terms of uh, breathing-related sleep disorders, we got the first and the underlying problem here in our uh, in our breathing breathing dynamics during sleep and we, we might be having some issues with like obstructive sleep apnea or we might have central sleep apnea we have intermittent hypoxia so the oxygen delivery is negatively affected and we have desaturation so the blood oxygen saturation will be decreased intermittently and meanwhile we do have the problem of deoxygenation in critical areas of the brain. And you know, we everyone appreciates the fact that we spend like seven, eight hours asleep. So when we do not have enough inappropriate oxygenation to the brain, something certainly is gonna go awry. And that's why we, we, we're just thinking about something organically there, like sleep or breathing disorder. But at the end of the day, what we have is like cognitive issues. We have like motor, sensory, emotion, emotional, or behavioral uh, dysregulations. So uh, what I'm going to highlight here in this slide is that we, we have a wide, varied range of different sleep-related predicaments. Some of them are directly uh, nested in the brain functionality, in the brain uh, networks, and also the cortical, subcortical interactions. Some of them are, are rooting from somewhere else. But at the same time, what we encounter is that they eventually negatively affect the brain functionality, cognitive, motor, sensory, and emotional performance, and behavioral derangements. So to just highlight some of the key uh, types of sleep-related disorders, one of them is circadian rhythm sleep-wake problems. Some of the people sleep late and they wake up late. Some of the people sleep earlier than expected and they wake up earlier than expected. They have 
early morning awakening. They might be having issues with the jet lag or when you're traveling across the time zone, they wouldn't have the circadian rhythmicity well in place. So they will be having so much difficulty in getting back to rhythm. And by that, the brain will, will get this, this regulation and in, in, in sort of like, you know, organizing and, and regulating the, the, the presentation, expression, and excretion, uh, genes and proteins. So the proteins and the neural dynamics within the cells, within the neurons, and in the extracellular neural space, we do have problems when, we, when we're facing cir circadian rhythm sleep-wake problems. Some of the people are coming to our doors and they are complaining prim primarily about their shift work sleep disorder. Still, shift work sleep disorder is one, is one of those issues. We have hypersomnolence disorder. People have excessive daytime sleepiness. So generally speaking, inefficient wakefulness mostly results from inefficient sleep. So when sleep is not right there and when we're not having an efficient sleep, then uh, some, some issues with hypersomnolence, May, may come up or the people may not be doing their best performance or best level of performance during the daytime. They might be having some issues with their, uh, with motor control. For instance, they would be having like restless leg syndrome. The 25, it turns out that 25% of the people who have restless leg syndrome, they turn out to have uh, like uh, PLMD, which stands for periodic leg movement disorder, insomnia disorder. It might be interesting for some of you to learn to know that we got like seven, uh, we got like 14 different types of insomnia disorder. It's not like, well, well, the subject, the patient coming to us is, is, or we're doing research. Well, our research population, they are insomniacs, so to speak. And what we need to do is that, okay, the treatment for insomnia is sleep aid medication, is a downer, is like benzodiazepine or different classes of sleep aid medications. It's far from reality. We need to know what type or what subtype of, of insomnia the, paper, the patient is already struggling with. You've probably seen cases with nar narcolepsy, or narcolepsy with or without cataplexy. So these are the cases who have abrupt sleep attacks with a loss of body tone, which is coming back to normal uh, after like a matter of few minutes. Nightmare disorder. There has been a bunch of research which is just cross-correlating the the range of nightmare disorders and different types of behavioral sleep predicaments to affective dysregulation. So those people who already have like uh, uh, depression, anxiety, PTSD, or different range of phobias, they might be having issues with the nightmare disorder. And REM behavioral sleep disorder, REM sleep behavioral disorder is that the people, patients, they are acting out their dreams and they might be harming themselves or their bed partners or other people. And they do not have this uh, like uh, normal or expected REM-related atonia, all right? So what, the reason that I'm highlighting this kind of thing is that we just want to open the window first, and then we go, we got to be diving in to talk about the brain mapping stuff, right? Then non-REM sleep arousal disorders. People have uh, sexomnia. People have sleep-related eating disorder. People have somnambulism, so they, they wake up and they have sleep walking, but they do not have any uh, remnant memory for that, okay? And substance and medication and use sleep disorders, it's a huge range of different sleep problems that some of them are still unidentified and they, are, they have uh, literally remained unexplained in many dimensions. So to, to tap into this kind of questions, what really happens in the brain, what we are doing in clinical context and a research platforms, we're using different methodologies, uh, including the quantitative EEG or functional near infrared spectroscopy. Also, we're using the, uh, the ERP, the NIRS, and the HAG or, or hemoencephalography. Uh, fortunately, somewhere soon, we'll be able to apply a magnetoencephalography or MEG-related studies in our sleep research. And also fMRI, sometimes you just uh, sedate the case and then you put the patient in the gantry of the MRI and you pursue the fMRI. But uh, all of them are not compatible with the, with the I mean, normal expected or like the, 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 uh, uh, the expected atmosphere or the ambience that the subject wants to be arrested or having a sleep, all right? So it's important not to, not to interfere 
with the nature of a sleep, why we're doing the sleep as much as what we're doing the sleep research as much as possible. So we acquire the data while the subject or the patient is already asleep. The patient will go through stages, as we all appreciate in the sleep. We have stages. We have uh, shallow sleep, N2 sleep, and we have deep sleep or something so-called uh, slow wave sleep. And then we have the, uh, the remarkable uh, paradoxical sleep or, or REM sleep. So uh, we are just having this uh, uh, ups and downs as a sleep so cycle, and that goes on and on in different cycles. So we have like a journey that the journey, which, which, which takes like for seven to, uh, seven to eight hours, would include four to five cycles of sleep. So, and we can, we can think that by this, each of the sleep cycles is going to take uh, as long as a football match. It's like a 90 minute you know, period. So within this 90 minute period of time, we're just going through different stages or different uh, steps of our sleep. And predominantly sleep is uh, about the N2. Uh, we do have uh, the, the critical uh, sleep uh, uh, phases or sleep stages, which is called N3 or slow wave sleep and REM sleep, which are both important for reconsolidation of memory and also rearrangements of the brain signals, refurbishment of the brain chemistry, uh, cleaning up or sweeping the brain off from uh, the, the waste materials of free radicals or, or, or other like, I mean, waste materials in the brain. Of course, we do need to have different stages of sleep, but the main stay of sleep is N2. And in N2, not only we have this brain signals that we can see very easily when we're saying, okay, this is like uh, the, 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 the background EEG of the sleep in, in N2, and we have the sleep spindles, we have fast or slow sleep spindles, and also we have the K-complexes, and by that, we can signify that this is the N2 sleep. That's very fine. But also, we, we do have some other microstructures in sleep. So the, the overall structure of sleep, like different stages, while we're labeling a specific stage of sleep is called macrostructure, if you like. And when we're just, you know, uh, deep diving to study uh, EEGs or other brain-related uh, signals uh, during the sleep in a more uh, specific manner, and to find out those specific components and to extract those specific common special patterns, those are called the microstructures of sleep. So one of those microstructures of sleep that we're going to tap into today in the presentation is the CAP, or cycling alternating pattern, which is something interesting. I'm not sure if, if most of you are familiar with that concept, but that is really important, and we're going to uh, highlight some of the key parameters regarding the CAP CAP or cycling alternating patterns. Okay, o over the past like 10, 15 years, we all have come across um, many different study outputs, many research findings that they are indicating the significance and importance of efficiency in sleep and uh, proper macrostructure or sleep cycle integrity with respect to the, the, the behavioral and mental health. It has been shown that like the uh, the childhood, the childhood experiences of sleep disturbances, they would have negative and adverse impact on the neuropsychobehavioral behavioral and cognitive performance of the cases of the patients uh, in, in their later life. And also there have been several uh, assays in the USA and other continents have been showing that uh, when we have sleep disorder breathing and we have uh, like uh, affective predicaments, it has been shown that in many instances, the affective problems and sleep disorder breathing, they go hand in hand. Also, we have evidence backing up the idea that the frequent insufficient sleep and anxiety and depressive disorders are kind of uh, interdigitated. And we know from the literature that there is an association between the psychological distress and self-reported sleep duration in a population-based a sample of women and went and men this these are this some kind of you know sample studies that i've extracted i pulled up here and i just wanted to um uh you know tap into one of those studies which has which has shown that the sleep duration is critical in terms of all different variables uh with respect to the psychological health and mental well-being 
So in, the, in that particular study, when that when in 2013, when they studied the people that they have the average sleep within 24 hours, less than six hours, or between seven and eight hours, or more than seven or more than nine hours, and they they kind of you know uh, uh, made a surveillance for the behavioral risk factors uh, uh, in the in those cases, and they have. Uh, sort of analyze the, the behavioral profile of those cases. It turns out that patients with less than six hours of sleep, 63.5% of those cases, cases they, they, they end up having like ser serious psychological disorders. And interestingly, like 32% of those cases with less than six hours of sleep had non-serious psychological distresses. And by that, we were refer this study was referring to hopelessness, for example or disinhibition, or lack of interest, or low energy, or appetite issues, or feeling like failure, or being slow or fidgety. And these are the things that, uh, that and amongst men and women, it was shown to be uh, very positively correlated with the number of hours of sleep. So the less sleep that women had, the more uh, significant psychological symptoms they ended up with. And it was more pronounced in women as compared to men. So sleep deprivation in long run is, is absolutely detrimental. And we've got to be studying about the number of hours that the subject in our sleep laboratory or sleep study set up, the number of hours that uh, someone is in the bed, which we call it time in bed. For instance, the subject goes to the bed, we have the lights out at 12 a.m., then we have the lights, uh, I mean, on, at like 7 a.m. So overall, it turns out that the subject has been in the bed for like seven hours, like, uh, right? But within the seven hours, we need to just kind of understand how many hours out of the seven hours efficiently or actually that a specific subject or patient has been going through real sleep stages. And by that, by, by dividing the number of, uh, but not, uh, number of hours that the subject has literally experienced the sleep to the time in bed, we have total sleep time. And this total sleep time, uh, uh, which is divided to time in bed, which give us uh, like, a, like an equation. And by that, we'll have a percentage, which is sleep efficiency. And when the sleep efficiency is less than 85%, something is not right. And we've got to be finding out about the baseline pathophysiological aspects of uh, what has really caused this. Okay? So you see that some patients, they, they come up to our doors and they are being evaluated for their sleep macro and microstructures. They are getting polysomnography testing. And we all hope that for for the coming months or, or somewhere soon, we'll be able to establish our polysomnography or sleep brain mapping setup, brain mapping setup with six to four EEG channels in the National Brain Mapping Laboratory. And this is the plan. So we're gonna put the efforts together with the, with the managing board of the MBML to hopefully establish and set up this uh, uh, SPM or sleep brain mapping uh, facility for going into depth of studies into uh, into the neurological and neurodynamics and psychobehavioral parameters in the brain while the people are asleep. And the effect of that, I mean, reflection of those sleep-related issues on their wakeful uh, state and how they're performing behaviorally or cognitively if they have or they do not have sleep-related issues. So here, for example, you see that you see that we have done a polysomnography in our brain, uh, in our in our brain and sleep disorders laboratory. So uh, we, we do have those sleep behavioral sleep disorders lab, and this subject has been uh, going under the surveillance of uh, a video recording over time that she has been uh, sleeping overnight. And also we have had like 32 channels of uh, EEG recording, and uh, a part of the array is, is, is evident here. And we've had the EMG, we have had the uh, the chest and abdominal sensors for the breathing pattern and how, uh, how the subject is making an effort to take the breathing inside and outside, uh, inhale and exhale. And also uh, the heart rate variability. Also, we do have the oxygen level saturation, the eye movement. We have uh, like a microphone sensor for detection of the snoring. And we have the EEG, EMG in the hands and also the legs to make sure that the subject is having like abrupt 
limb movement during the sleep. And at the same time, we're, we're going for uh, the EEG as, as it highlighted here. So by putting them all together, we are just recording almost 18 different biological sleep-related parameters in polysomnography testing, apart from those 32 channels of uh, EEG and QEEG, if you like. So putting them all together, then we're going to materialize and bank on that those kind of data captured. And then we find out uh, th this finding, we're just going to find out the correlation between these findings and their wakeful state performance, either motor, sensory, or emotional, or cognitive, most importantly. So we're given the cases, some cognitive tasks in the day. We let them sleep. We let them have a nap during the day or not having a nap during the day. Some of them, they do have initially some background sleep-related problems overnight. Some of them are doing just fine. And we're cross-comparing the cognitive outcome of those cases. And we're, we're just you know making the cross-check between the cognitive outcome, sleep parameters, and QEEG. Can you imagine? So putting that together, we just having this uh, the, like a cross-modal uh, idea of analyzing the data together. And that's the beauty of the thing. So let me, let me just draw your attention to a, a concept which is called cycling Alter, uh, uh, like cyclic alternating pattern or cap. A cap is very important because it helps us to stay alive. So if we do not have a cap, we might not have survived in one of our episodes of sleeping with some, something hazardous, like a, like a risk, uh, where we're facing a risk. For example, if, uh, if an animal is invading us and we're asleep, so we see, we feel, the roar of that lion, right? We see, we feel the change in the temperature, the sound, the the the, the flash of light, whatever, which is which is like a threat from the environmental cues. So although we're asleep, but we have this like sensory gating still in place, but feel it, and then we're just going to get yourself, get ourselves away from the danger. Okay, and that is that is how the brain is like making this flip flop or this fluctuation or this instability in the level of our arousal, if you like. So if we do pretty well in having the good control of an arousal level, then we might be switching from one stage to another stage and eventually, if needed, to wakeful state. So imagine if someone has sleep apnea and the patient has got these issues with breathing. So first, he would have some snoring because because snoring comes from what we we can we can guess it comes from the 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 turbulence of the air which is passing through a narrowed airway. So the narrowed airway is just uh, pushing through the air, and that by the by the by the turbulence of this of, of the airflow, then we have this sound. <sighs> well, this sound, this this uh, snoring is nothing but the the flow of the air which is just vibrating the back throat tissue but sometimes the scenario becomes even worse and it's not only the storing and the storing is so high pitch and it turns out that the subject has got this uh, flow limitation so it'll be something like this so by this we got around like 40 to 60 percent of the airflow already taken out so by that we would expect having desaturation or intermittent hypoxia, as if you, uh, uh, if you can imagine. And the, the, the extreme scenario is that when the subject has the, the obstructive sleep apnea. So this is when we have the total collapse of the airway. So literally no air is passing through. The subject is just struggling. It's just making an effort to breathe, but there is no flow exchange. So that's like this. And by this, when this episode is taking longer than 10 seconds, and we have around 4% drop in the, in the arterial oxygen saturation, then we say that literally we have an episode of apnea. So thank God, the brain senses the apnea and the subject arouses, I mean, the brain signal arouses, and we just get ourselves away from danger. We survive. Otherwise, we'll die. Literally, we'll die. Okay, so that is because of these caps. These caps are putting the brain on the alert, and we have these fluctuations in the different dynamics in the brain. So we have we have the background, so which is called phase B. Okay, 
But everything about the cap comes from the phase A or arousal. So we have arousal background, arousal background, A, B, A, B. So if you look at the, uh, the graph on the bottom of the page here, we have the phase A here, and then we have the background phase B, then again phase A, then phase B. So these fluctuations like the waves on the sea, you see that we have ups and downs. So in these specific uh, uh, microstructural aspects in the brain, we have the phase A as the most important uh, like electrophysiological component, which, which signifies the presence of caps. And the phase A is... Uh, uh, And the phase A is also really uh, relevant because they are putting together the, uh, the kind of fluctuation in the arousability, in arousal level. But in case we have the arousal instability, the micro arousals are very frequent in the, at, the, at the cortical level, then the brain would not go in the really deep different stages of sleep. So sleep is like halfway through. So we cannot go through different stages. We cannot go through cycles. That's why patients with a range of sleep problems, they would have uh, uh, in, a, a disrupted sleep cycle integrity. But if you look at the, the above, you see that, okay, we have the background of the first part. Then we have some uh, like uh, uh, K-complex um, sort of uh, similar deflections in the background noise, in the, in the background recording. Then we have the arousal. So within this box, you see that we have the event-related desynchronization. And by that, we have sort of arousal or micro-arousal, if you put it like that. Then we go back to the background. When we have the sequence of A, B, A, B, then we have uh, uh, the, the, the cap sequences. When we just have one A, which is, which is just followed by B, phase B, we have a cap cycle. So we have cap sequence, we have cap cycles, we have the spindles, and we have the K-complexes. So at this point, we just need to make sure that we got an understanding, a shared understanding that these kind of specific common special patterns in the sleep EEG are referred to as uh, the sleep microstructures or the sleep EEG microstructures. Okay? And then... Um, uh, what, what we have here, if you take a look at this uh, time series, what you see that we have like a background, which is not highlighted. But if, if I and you would just zoom out from the monitor of, of, of our laptops, then we go like a, like a meter behind and we look at this image from a zoom out perspective. Then you see that, that from, from some parts to another part, we have some changes in the background deflection pattern. Okay, and that's why we can call that these areas are kind of th are kind of areas that we we have some changes in the background pattern or common special pattern. If we use the AI machine learning, if we're using the the the, the deep learning methods, uh, and by that we categorize, we do the component analysis, a principal component analysis or independent component analysis for these specific changes in the pattern or the background uh, background oscillations. Then, uh, by machine learning, the computer would recognize that this is a uh, like uh, this is uh, this is the phase A of the cap cycle, and then okay, we can also visually detect when we are seeing these patterns for years and years. Then we have uh, we have this uh, I mean uh, propensity to to understand and to realize and to detect these kind of uh, uh, patterns. So we have phase A, which is highlighted in red. Uh, and yellow, and then phase B, again A, B, and again A, B. Is that clear? And then what we do is that we have the question in mind that at what level people with or without range of sleep problems, more importantly, those who have like, uh, what you call it, uh, like obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, how would you cross correlate the, the, the predominance or the distribution of the cap signals or the cap patterns with their cognitive performance? So if they have issues with their cognitive aptitude in the, in the daytime uh, testing, at what level that could be related or kind of cross correlated with the pattern of the cap distribution? So we can source localize the cap, of course, 
And the caps are generally, as I highlighted before, the caps are being detected mainly in, uh, in the N2, in the stage two of sleep, exactly where we have the, uh, the K complexes and the sleep spindles. So we can source localize the sleep spindles uh, from different, you know, uh, cortical structures and cortical hubs in the brain. And also we can, we can also source localize the, uh, the, uh, the, the caps in the brain. So sleep spindles, K complexes and caps. So these are the three main key microstructures in a sleep that we're going to find sort of like possible correlation between the distribution spectral spectral and spatial distribution of those patterns with uh, with regards to cognitive performance but if you like behavioral uh aptitude or if you like it might be like uh, a like sensory aptitude okay motor aptitude so it's it's a huge realm it's a huge perspective for putting together different ideas and questions and and uh, and, and just pursue research for it okay and uh, there are, we, I'm receiving some questions. That would be great if, if my colleagues here, I, I, I totally can appreciate and, and, uh, and uh, uh, realize that how important your questions are. But if you like, just to uh, stay away from distractions, uh, make your questions there ready. And at the end of the talk, I'll be more than happy to take any questions and definitely uh, put that into discussion. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, so getting back to the a range of uh, neuropsychological assessment batteries that we're uh, testing our subjects with in our behavioral sleep disorders unit research line. Uh, we got a pipeline for research activities, as I highlighted before. Uh, we, we check them for reaction timing. We check them for attention switching task or AST. We use the CANTAP for rapid visual processing. We use the CANTAP for one, stock ex one touch stocking of Cambridge. And by this, we can go for uh, assessment of the different perspectives and their cognitive performance ranging from processing speed to attention and um, executive functions. Okay. There is something wrong with the with the graphics, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohamed Yan. I cannot see the graphics here. Can I? Uh, No, the graphics are not there. I mean, um, slide is empty. Yes, that would be a good idea. Yeah. If you can share my screen, that would be awesome. Thank you, sir. Perfect. So uh, let me take the last question, then, then we'll move on. So the question is, what are most widely used cognitive assessment tools for sleep disorders? It depends on your research question. If you're going to tap into uh, like processing speed, then you have some platforms specifically used for that, for that research question. If you're going to go for executive functions or attention, memory performance, then you got to go for, uh, for your desired platform. So the platforms could be pen and pencil platforms. They might be computerized, media-rich uh, platforms. So it depends on your... But something is for certain that the that a battery that you are using uh, should be validated. It should be culture and language blind if you're doing something at, uh, at an overall perspective. And also it needs to be uh, matching with the purpose of the research that we're pursuing. Thank you for that, sir. This is good. Okay, so uh, am I able to flip the slides or you'll do that for me? Okay, okay. So here we have this... Uh, scalp topography mapping of the slow components of the cap. And as I said before, we have like slow component of cap and then we have fast component of cap, all right? So both of these components are referred to as the phase A. So when we're talking about the arousal, when we're talking about the micro arousal phase of the cap, we're just focusing on the cap phase A. And the cap phase A has got A1, A2, and A3. A1 is the slowest component of the, of the cap, okay? So again, we have cap cycles A plus B. A is the arousal and B is the background, okay? And let's talk about A. And in the A phase of the cap, we have three different subsections. We have A1, A2, and A3. 
A1 is the, is the slowest part. We call it slow component of cap, which ranges from 0.25 to 2.5 hertz in oscillation. Then we have A2, which is the, the middle segment of the A phase of the cap. And then we have A3. So the more we're approaching from A1 to A3, the faster the frequency becomes. And when it comes to the background phase B, then we have the fastest possible. Okay. So let's focus on the first part of the arousability and the and this uh, cap cycles. We're talking now about the A1 segment uh, or the slowest component of the cap uh, phases. And we, we have studied this in 104 subjects who were having issues with their obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. So according to the ICSD, we first categorized these cases based on the sleep study. We did the sleep research, a sleep study for them, like the, the, the formal polysomnography, the mainstream test. And it turns out that they do have the sleep apnea syndrome, or they have obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome, OSH, OSAHS. So those cases were mild to moderate cases of obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome. And the, the, the age range was between 13 to 60 years old. And overall, we had 104 cases. And, uh, and then we cross-compared these 104 cases with other cases who were not being diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome. And according to our findings, it turns out that we have the distribution of the slow component of the cap mainly in the frontal part of the brain. So the very front part of the frontal prefrontal cortex or the frontal polar aspects of uh, areas of the frontal lobe and also some areas in the anterior cingulate cortex when we were doing the source localization was the main area uh, of uh, the accumulation or the special distribution of of uh, of the slow component of cap regardless of the age range you see that whatever the case of the age range was then we had the distribution of uh, the slow component of cap in the frontal part of the brain does that make sense so can we go to the next slide, please, sir? Mr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mohamed, you on next slide? Thanks. So let's let's take a look at a closer look at the rapid component of the cap. We did this uh, with the with with extraction of the rapid component of the cap, and then we used the S Loretta and Loretta to do the source localization for uh, for the cap cycle patterns. And it turns out for the rapid component of cap or A2 overall a2 uh, we have the swing of uh, or we have this i mean transposition of this cap signals from the very frontal parts of the brain to the center parietal areas of the brain so overall we have this uh, we have the co collection of this uh, rapid component of the caps in the posterior cingulate cortex and posterior parietal cortices okay and it, and interestingly it did not really change uh, with respect to the variable of age so whatever the age of the of the of the patient populations were again these cases were cases with obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome we had the same pattern being generated okay can we have next slide please thank you so here what what you can exp what you can expect from the s loretta uh, uh and loretta analysis of the cap slow component like what we did uh, to, to just source localize the distribution of the slow component of cap, as we highlighted before. Uh, this is a subsection of the cases that we, we, had the, we had the grand average of the source localized slow component of cap. And the number of the cases were 43. The age range was 25 to 45. And these cases were cases with uh, obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome, right? So if we go next slide, uh, I'll be touching on the distribution of not the slow component of the cap, but the fast component. Can we go to next, please? Thank you. No, 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 the one before. Thank you very much. So here you see that we again applied the Loretta and S Loretta uh, application for the detection of the accumulation of the rapid component of the cap. And as, as we highlighted before in the other perspective, in the other uh, you know array of the figures that I that I shared here, we have the the accumulation we have the the position of this slow component uh, i'm sorry rapid components of the cap in the more dorsal 
areas of the brain. I mean, in the in the like the posterior uh, singlet uh, area, a singlet cortex, and the posterior uh, parietal cortices. Okay, so here again, we're talking about uh, like forty three cases, the same compound, the same subpopulation of the study pop the cases, but now on the rapid component cap. So can we go next? And interestingly, we're now doing the surgery. We're doing, we're just, you know, de uh, deep diving into the anatomy of the caps in a, in a more detailed perspective. So we see that we have the cap phase A, A1, A2, and A3, as we were just discussing a little while before. A3 was relatively faster. A2 was the middle uh, frequency uh, in terms of the oscillation speed and a1 was the slowest so as you see in a1 we had the distribution of the caps in the frontal parts of the brain and the anterior inferior uh, frontal lobule and also in the anterior cingulate cortex and then frontopolar and orbitofrontal cortices and even some areas at the medial uh, prefrontal ventral medial prefrontal cortices. Then for the A2A and A2B, still we have this, but when we're switching from A2A to A2B, then we have this transposition of uh, the accumulation of the cap signals. I mean, a, a, uh, the A phase cap signals, A2 uh, phase cap signals from the far, frontal part of the brain to the dorsal part of the brain. Okay, so we still have gradually this transposition from A2A to A2B. So it turns out that the A2A is the cutoff, right? So A2A is the very exact point of time or point of, uh, uh, of our time series where the brain signals in the A phase of the cap are being translocated and more dorsally positioned rather than being located in the frontal part of the brain. Can we go next, please? And if I can, if I can just uh, play this video, can you play this video, Dr. Mohamedia? If you would do that, it would be awesome. You just click on it and then you play the video because you already have the source file. Fantastic, fantastic. So what you can see here is that we do not have any cap here. Still, now we started to have the cap phase A. Then we have the transposition of the cap phase A2 to the posterior parts. And then we're done coming back to the background again and again. Take a look at it and you'll realize. This is exactly where we have right now. And then phase two, A2, and then B, A3 and B. So the video is looping, and that's why you just see that over and over again. Thank you. So if we get back to the slides, if you will. Appreciate that. Does that make sense, uh, what, I'm, what I'm just communicating with you? Are you are you following me? Or this is something that you can kind of resonate with your background knowledge? Or is that something that you can uh, uh, kind of uh, relate to your, your questions or your thoughts in terms of sleep studies or research? Can you just give me a feedback? Because it's important uh, that what you want to hear from me, not what I would like to talk about. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Okay, so uh, if we can go to, can we go slide back, please, doctor? Okay, next slide, please. Appreciate it. All right, according to one of the researchers that we have recently published in the Journal of Scandinavia uh, of Sleep Medicine, uh, it was uh, a study which was sort of scrutinizing the distribution of the, the K complexes. So again, we're talking about some other thing. One of the other is microstructural aspects or patterns in sleep EEG, which kind of cross correlates to the cognitive performance. So we have had, like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, let me precise, let me be precise. We had 40, we had 42. We had 42 cases with, uh, with uh, cogniform disorder. So may, you may perhaps have heard about 
cogniform disorder and cogniform condition, okay? So cogniform disorder is that the subject will come to your clinic, will come to your facility, and uh, they have subjective cognitive impairment, they have SCI, you do the testing and it turns out that yes, he does have issues with the cognitive performance. So in this case, the person objectively and subjectively is found to have some issues with their cognitive aptitude. In this case, we would call them cog cognitive disorder, cogniform disorder. But in some cases, people are coming and they're very, very apprehended in terms of the problems with the cognition. They have subjective cognitive impairment, but when we do the testing, the results show that they do not have any, any you know, objectively driven or objectively approved cognitive issues. So they think that they do have a problem, but when we do the testing, it turns out that they do not have any specific cognitive issues. So they're called cognitive condition, a uh, cogniform condition. But in this case, we were just confronting a series of cases that they have cogniform disorder. This means that objectively and subjectively, they found to have cog uh, cognitive problems. And we did the we did the testing using the the CanTab and the and the Cambridge Brain Science Cognitive Platform, and we also applied the uh, the, the the ACE or Edinburgh Cognitive Examination a battery. And it turns out that these cases with cogniform disorder, they have had some issues with uh, uh, like uh, uh, problem with their sleep. They were having like long-term sleep deprivation. They, were, they have had some issues with sleep flow limitation, with respiratory problems in their sleep. Okay, so anyhow, they were cross-compared with, with some other cases with uh, normal uh, healthy controls. So we have CD or cogniform disorder as compared to healthy control. And what we're looking for, can you imagine what it was? It was K-complexes. So we're looking for isolating the spatial distribution of the K complexes, the cortical areas of the brain, while the subjects were going through the N2. And interestingly, when we're subtracting the distribution of the K complex density, I mean, the number of the K complexes per minute in N2 sleep. And apparently, cases with uh, cogniform disorder, they show to have significantly less number of k-complexes per minute in their n2 sleep so if someone is i mean the take-home message from this study is that if someone coming to our clinic is complaining about memory problem one of the measures could be assessing his sleep so when we assess when we evaluate his sleep or her sleep and it shows that he's just saying goodbye to his k-complexes then this could be uh, consider as one of the biomarkers or neuromarkers, if you like, to label the case as, as, as a potentially susceptible case for mild cognitive impairment, dementia of Alzheimer's type, or a progressive questionable dementia, or ultimately Alzheimer's disease. So that's how we can cross-correlate the, the sleep bioparameters and sleep microstructures to, 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 to uh, polysomnography and cognitive performance cases who are pr primarily coming to our clinic or setups or research facilities complaining of subjective cognitive impairment. So can we go to next, please? If we move to the next slide, very good. So I, I, while I was presenting, I was, I was just seeing that some of the colleagues were so excited and thank you for this excitement. You were sharing some very, very relevant and good questions regarding the applications of fMRI into the study of, uh, of sleep. And that is pretty much relevant, you're right. So fMRI uh, can be used for the assessment of functional connectivity uh, with regards to sleep duration and sleep efficiency. And there has been a bunch of studies out there uh, they've been showing that, that uh, the fMRI during natural sleep has been, uh, has been used as a method to study the brain function during early childhood. So when the, when the functionality and the neural dynamics in the fMRI, the distribution of the bold signals in different sleep stages, what, what the way that we expect as per age and gender, it was sort of predictive marker for for a favorable outcome in their cognitive, neurodevelopmental, behavioral, motor, and sensory performance as the subjects were aging. So yes, definitely fMRI can be uh, a uh, like a favorable assessment tool for the evaluation of the neural connectivity and functional 
connectivity map in the brain. Of course, you're right. And there has been another study which has examined the, uh, the fact that short sleepers with or, with or without perceived daytime dysfunction might be having different patterns in their functional connectivity. All right. Can we move on to next slide, please, Dr. Mohamedia? Dr. Mohamedia, can you move on to next slide? Please bear with me. Thank you. Okay. So here we have this, uh, uh, this study which shows that, well, some cases, you probably have heard about the people who have very, very low threshold for excitability. They have very minuscule auditory or acoustic stimulus, and they wake up. So they have this sleep fragmentation. These, they have this hyper arousability. And it shows that, uh, it has been shown that in some fMRI studies, these cases have hyperactivity in the, uh, in the occipital parietal, and most importantly, in the left and right superior temporal gyri during their sleep. So in their N2 sleep, they have this hyper excitability, hyper excitability and this enhanced bolt signal functionality in their, uh, in their fMRI baseline. Can we go next? And this has been shown in different sets of uh, studies as well. So this has been shown that people with a range of sleep problems uh, uh, in, in terms of poor sensory gating or different insomnias, uh, one, of the, one of the subtypes of insomnia is we call them psychophysiological insomnia or PPI, if you can search it. Uh, you'll, you'll find a bunch of studies that highlight the significance of PPI. We have another type of insomnia, which is called BIISS, which stands for Behaviorally Induced Insufficient Sleep Syndrome. So both in PPI, or psychophysiological insomnia, and BIISS, uh, fMRI data has indicated that these cases have really enhanced and hyper-excited areas in the cortical hubs of the brain, specifically in, uh, in, the, in the visual and also auditory and sensory, primary sensory motor cortex in the brain. This might not be the case for INU, but those cases with PPI, with psychophysiological insomnia, hyperarousability, or sensory problem, sensory processing disorder during sleep, they do have this really, really excitable cortex in the brain. So a question might be this, can we find out about this cortical hobs and can we use any sort of neurofunctional modalities, including neuromodulation or neural stimulation or electrical suppression or magnetic suppression of the cortical hops. If you look at the panel here in the middle, we have the principal component two, and it was shown that some areas of this uh, cross-component relation between, for example, like, like the right cerebellum as a visual area, with the the primary visual cortex it shows to have it is shown to have really uh i mean uh, minuscule almost no cross cross correlation so there is no matrix uh, of a cross correlation or coherence between these two areas this means that we literally do not have a functional connectivity between the uh the the left cerebellum uh and also the visual uh, primary visual cortex but if we find some hot spots here for instance, for a single case study and in the fMRI EEG, sleep EEG study, it's tr it, that's why we're just saying uh, some, some pearls regarding the significance of doing the co-registered fMRI QEG sleep study. So we, we find that, well, there is, a, there is a correlation between the right cerebellum as an executive functional area and the primary motor cortex. As you see in the middle panel, the, the box there, the voxel is in red, is in dark red. This means a high coherence level. So if we're going to, uh, you know, downscale the activity of this specific voxel, but using the low frequency TMS in the wakeful state, or using this suppression, a cathodal suppression using the TES, then the level of excitability in that specific cortical area of the brain is going to get less and less and less. And by time, the patient is coming to us saying that, yo, Thank you, doctor. You help me with less excitability. You help me with less arousability, and you help me with less sleep fragmentation. I used to be really waken up easily by a very minuscule, uh, you know, visual or acoustic stimulus, but now it's not the case. Can we move next? 
And that's all about the, 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 the excitability and also the dysfunctional parameters that we can, we can expect from those people who have short sleep uh, complaints. So those people who have short sleep duration, for instance, less than six hours per night, some of them might be coming with re reported dysfunctions, neuroticism or anxiety. Some of them may deny this. Or those who may deny this might be cases of, of hyper, hypomania or, or they might not be cases with uh, extroversion. But uh, fact of the matter is that we need to go for increased connectivity and or decreased connectivity of those areas. So when we're using neuromodulation, you know, guys, this is exactly what I'm going to highlight. When we are using the neuromodulation to sort of alter the neurodynamics on the cortical areas, this is how we can modulate. They can, this is how we can manipulate the cortical subcortical cortical brain hubs during wakefulness and having the reflection of that over sleep. To me, that's super exciting. I don't know about you, but just to kind of alter the brain dynamics during wakefulness and see the consequences over sleep, that is really something. And then if we go to the, to the next slide, please. So here are the model, and here's, here's, this is my last, uh, my last slide. This is the model that we've come up with with our colleagues in Geneva, in Switzerland, and this is the inclusive brain health model. And we've put together some other parameters uh, which, are, which are really helping and contributing to our state of brain health. If you look at the very central part of this, para if, if, of this diameter, that is exactly where all the lines are intersecting. That is the point for harmony. That is the point or, or, of our mental health and our mental aptitude, okay? Well, what contributes to that? Body, brain, and surrounding. Look at the inverted yellow triangle. What else would contribute to that? Central nervous system, autonomic nervous system, peripheral nervous system. Look at the upright black triangle. What else would contribute to that? Look at the circle, the behavior, the cognition, and emotion. And finally, the thing which is contributing to this whole harmony is the, is the square. We have the allostatic stress load, genetics. We have nutrition and physical activity. And most importantly, what we have talked about here was sleep and wakefulness, which is very dear and near to my heart when I do research. Uh, and I hope that I've just transmitted a part of my excitement and my interest in the field of sleep studies today with you here. I, get, I think that we got a couple of minutes for very, very quick touch on the key questions that we have here. And really thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope this has been opening some new horizons in front of all of us to go for further research together. And don't forget that we have NBML. And don't forget that we have this platform for a shared interest, shared activities. We can do things together. No one is uh, is like know it all. So we, we just need to do it together. Is it possible to investigate each phase of sleep, not, not the disorder, just by EEG, QEG, fMRI? Can we do that with or only with FM, resting state fMRI? I'm not sure. You know, sleep, sleep is a, like a multimodal state. So we need to know if we, we do have the, the, the normal, like atonia, in the REM sleep, we do have this rapid eye movement in, in, the, in the REM sleep. If you do not have those bioparameters, we're just going to focus on the brain. We cannot necessarily locate uh, or we cannot isolate any specific part and relate that to uh, any specific sleep stage. No, we need to do sleep study. We need to do polysomnography. Uh, waiting for your speech since yesterday. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you. This is great to receive all those compliments from you. That's, by, that's been really my pleasure. Is it possible to sleep, sleep disorder employing EEG fMRI experiment? This is exactly what we are planning to do. And today we had a very short discussion with the board of the NBML, and they were really supportive and kind that fortunately, uh, and hopefully in the near future, we're going to set up the concurrent uh, you know, recording facility for fMRI, QEEG, and polysomnography when it comes to sleep research. And that's all for now, and that's my time. Thank you very much for bearing with me, and I hope in the next part of the uh, of the panel, we're going to have like the closing ceremony. the The principals of the MBML are going to uh, having some announcements for the awards and also everything of that respect. 
And I was for, so fortunate for the opportunity be, be, uh, for being here with you. And I hope that we would definitely catch up in an, an other similar symposia and scientific gatherings within the body uh, of the esteemed National Brain Mapping Laboratory. Thank you so much. اگر شما یه پژوهشگر حوزه مغز باشید حتما میدونید که برای انجام کارهای پژوهشیتون عمده ترین راه ممکن مراجعه به بیمارستان ها و استفاده از تجهیزات اوناست اما با توجه به حجم کاری این مراکز عملا استفاده از این تجهیزات جدا از نتیجه‌ای که میخواین یا غیر ممکنه یا با هدر رفتن زمان همراهه و یا در زمانهای نامناسب امکان پذیره ما چند سالی هست که دیگه پژوهشگران این دغدغه رو ندارن شب بپرسید چطوری؟ الان بهتون میگم از سال 1395 وزارت علوم و وزارت بهداشت با حمایت معاونت علمی و فناوری ریاست جمهوری یک پروژه ملی رو به عنوان اولین همکاری مشترک خودشون به انجام رسوندن تا علاوه بر کمک به محققین این حوزه روند انجام پروژه های جدید و پیشرفته رو در داخل کشور آسون تر کنن نتیجه این همکاری تأسیس آزمایشگاه ملی نقشه برداری محض شد مجموعی بسیار پیشرفته که با تمامی تجهیزات و امکانات خودش در اختیار محققین کل کشور قرار گرفت که خدمات تخصصی به پژوهشگران رشته های مختلف ارائه میده خب بیاین با هم ببینیم این آزمایشگاه چه امکاناتی داره شما از دستگاه امارای ستسلا برای تصویر برداری و دستگاه ثبت سیگنال های الکتریکی EEG و سیگنال های نوری افنیرز برای ثبت فعالیت های مغزی میتونید استفاده کنید علاوه بر این اگه خودتون تخصصی توی پردازش تصاویر و سیگنالاتون ندارین آزمایشگاه با امکانات پیشرفته به ویژه سرور محاسبات سریع این کار رو براتون انجام میده آزمایشگاه امکاناتی مثل تحریک مغناطیسی و الکتریکی مغز TMS و TDCS رو هم داره که توی نقشه برداری مغز خیلی مفیده همینطور نرم افزارهای بسیار بسیار پیشرفته وجود داره که میتونین برای ارزیابی شناختی و توان بخشی افراد ازش استفاده کنید و با استفاده از آزمایشگاه واقعیت مجازی میتونید موقعیتی رو تجربه و بازسازی کنید یه خبر هیجان انگیز دیگه این که داده هاتون رو میتونید توی بایو بانک نقش برداری مغز ایران IBMB ذخیره کنید تا پژوهشگرا توی دورترین نقطه کشور هم ازشون استفاده کنند تازه علاوه بر ارائه همه این خدمات آزمایشگاه ملی نقش برداری مغز نقش مهمی رو در آموزش پژوهشگران این حوزه داره میپرسید چطوری با برگزاری کارگاه های آموزشی سمینارهای تخصصی وبینارها دوره های کار آموزی و سمپوزیوم ها که همشون با تدریس اساتید برجسته خارجی و داخلی کشوره خبر خوب این که پژوهشگران میتونن خیلی راحت به صورت حضوری و یا خیلی آسون تر از طریق وبسایت این مجموعه به آدرس اینترنتی nbml.ir پروژهشون رو ثبت و بدون نگرانی در مورد تجهیزات و امکانات تخصصی روی پیش برد تحقیقاتشون تمرکز کنن اگر از خدمات آزمایشگاه استفاده کردید و پیشنهاد و یا انتقادی دارید حتما با ما در میون بذارید ما نظرات شما رو بررسی می کنیم و در اسرع وقت نتیجه رو بهتون اعلام می کنیم. آزمایشگاه ملی نقش برداری مغز اگر شما یه پژوهشگر حوزه مغز باشید حتما می دونید که برای انجام کارهای پژوهشیتون عمده ترین راه ممکن مراجعه به بیمارستان ها و آزمایشگاه ملی نقشه برداری مغز با استفاده از دستگاه تحریک الکتریکی که موجود هست در آزمایشگاه ما میتونیم با هشت کانال ثبت EEG رو انجام بدیم و با استفاده از این دستگاه و نرم افزاری که به مجموعه اضافه شده نور فیدبک رو هم انجام بدیم اینطور هستش که در واقع کلاه روی سرفرد قرار میگیره از اون نقاطی که مد نظرمون هست EEG ثبت میشه در بعضی از نقاط ممکنه دوا تحریک الکتریکی هم انجام بشه که میتونه به ادامه دار بودن فعالیت و ترین شدن مغز کمک بکنه و بازی رو فرد انجام میده که با استفاده از اون میتونه اون ایجی مورد نظرمون تقویت بشه و رفتار فرد به رفتار مطلوب نزدیکتر بشه ابزاری که توی آزمایشگاه هست در واقع جدیدن به این مجموعه اضافه شده و 